welcome to today's episode of Daily Debrief brought to you by People's Dispatch. I'm Swastika and let's get into our first story. We're on day three of the Russian offensive in Ukraine. The capital Kiev continues to be a key point and a decisive battle may take place today or in the coming days. Meanwhile, there are talks of talks with Ukrainian neutrality on the agenda. To discuss more on this, we have with us Prashant. Prashant, if you could give us some of the ground details that are happening at this point of time. Right, Swastika. So, as you said, a very fluctuating and rapidly changing situation on the ground because, first of all, reports are uh, coming in a flurry. How much of that is reliable or not still is often, you know, it's, it's war. Information warfare is also going on. So, But a few things are clear. One is the fact, of course, that Kiev is uh, pretty much right now the key uh, piece in this puzzle, so to speak, because... Uh, it looks like the Russians are set to launch a major offensive. In fact, the latest reports say that there is some street fighting that has broken out in Kiev itself. We do know that since yesterday, there have been forces, a Russian forces in the vicinity. So whether they are preparing for an all-out assault is really the question. And what will be the nature of resistance around Kiev from the Ukrainian side is also really the key question. Ukrainian President Zelensky is, uh, at least as of latest reports, still in Kiev. And he's indicated mm. his willingness to sort of continue the fight so uh, whether you know you know what might happen either to, might, today night might be a decisive night or the next few hours might be or at the most the one or two, coming one or two days might be very decisive not only as far as Kiev is concerned but with regard to the whole uh, war itself and we also know that on the side there have been attacks on many other key cities there is for instance the reports of the city of uh, Melitopol has uh, has been captured by yes. the Russians the Russians uh, the uh, allies of the Russians that is the uh, Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic forces have definitely made advances in the Donbass region as well. So, uh, overall, what do you call pretty much continuing the trend that we've seen over the past couple of days. Uh, the Russians do have superiority in the air. It's uh, in terms of uh, the missiles they'll be able to send or in terms of the air attacks they have. Whether the Ukrainian air defense has been completely destroyed is an open question. But definitely they have suffered some blows on that front. So uh, that's pretty much the situation as far as the battle is concerned on the ground because uh, it will be, so I think the, this, yeah. this one or two days might actually be very crucial like I said uh, because if we are lo looking at the possibility of a long drawn out, uh, you know, battle with a lot of, uh, say, casualties in Kiev, for instance, it could, uh, things could move in a completely different direction altogether. If the Russians uh, get a relatively quick victory, things could move in a completely different direction as far as the settling of uh, this war itself, as far as future negotiations are concerned. Uh, like you said, there have been uh, some c considerations and rumors of talks. You get the impression that backroom channels are still functioning somewhere to bring mm -hmm. some kind of a possibility of negotiations. Yesterday, there was a talk of some of these discussions holding being held in Minsk, for instance. That's what the Russians had offered. Uh, at some point, the Ukrainians have also indicated a willingness to talk. But the key question really will be two aspects. One is uh, Russia's uh, demand so far has been that when Ukraine has to be demilitarized first before you know some, any serious talks take place. Ukraine, on the other hand, uh, has uh, you know whether they are going to be open to the notion of neutrality which is really the key question here and which boils down to the last seven, eight years of NATO policies mm -hmm. and, you know, whether that will even be possible for Zelensky. These are actually some of the big questions that are actually right before us now. In fact, we have seen more measures by different countries against Russia and vice versa. What would be their impact? Uh, so what we're seeing right now is uh, we saw the first major round of sanctions take place from the United States, from the European countries on, uh, say, Russian banks, on uh, key, people, uh, key people in the Russian political elite, for instance. So after, after that, it has largely been a series of, say, mainly symbolic actions by individual countries, sometimes by corporations. Facebook has taken some action, for instance, prevented some Russian firms from monetizing uh, their, uh, on their platform. And simultaneously, Russia has also indicated restrictions on Facebook because of what it says is Facebook censorship of uh, R Russia based information. So, uh, the so cooperation, but largely by countries in terms of uh, how, you know, for say, closing of airspaces to Russian, uh, air, air, what do you call air flights, for instance, or, yes. there, you know, further sanctions against, uh, say, Russian oligarchs in terms of their being able to land in countries like the UK, for instance. And uh, we also heard of, of course, measures being planned against Putin and uh, Sergei Lavrov, who is the foreign minister of Russia. Now, uh, at, the, at, at the core of it, most of these are largely symbolic measures we need to realize because it, it's a very big question as to, for instance, whether 
uh, say, sanctions on the members of the Russian political elite will have a big impact at all. We saw that, I believe it's Jens Stoltenberg who said that they won't be able to access, buy Gucci shoes and all that. But we are, I don't know if that's actually a very serious set of considerations. The real, uh, the, real uh, you know, the core of all these sanctions is the financial aspect. And those were those related to the banks. But even then, we are not seeing an all-out assault sanctions-wise on the Russian banks. And this is largely due to the fact that any substantial sanctions regime which will hurt Russia is inevitably going to hurt yes. European, the Europeans the most, and also the West and people of the world in general. Yes. So I think there is a massive difference of opinion among various uh, you know, uh, power centers in Europe and the United States about the extent to which, uh, say, uh, these kind of sanctions are going to be imposed. For instance, if the SWIFT system is going to be, if Russia is going to be locked out of the SWIFT system, then the question of how Russia will be paid for the imports European countries are making is really a key question because none, there is no talk about stopping any of that. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's no quote, uh, this thing of, you know, we're going to cut energy or Russian energy exports immediately or uh, say any, uh, those kind of interactions, that nothing of that is even being talked about because it's impossible. Because, like, like I said, any pain on the Russian people will equally rebound on the people in Europe as well. And that has always been the issue with sanctions, that in an interconnected world, it is a very extremely inhumane practice. And uh, so, so we, uh, we, we have not really gone beyond too much beyond the symbolic is still what I would think as far as many of these sanctions are concerned. Uh, now, of course, as the battle rages on, the arguments for intensifying some of these sanctions will continue to increase. So, which is why I said that the state of the battle in the next one to two days might be very crucial mm -hmm. in determining the future of uh, this whole conflict and the larger geopolitical scenario itself. Mm. Because uh, yeah, the, as time passes, the pressure for increasing more and more of these sanctions will continue. The demand, for instance, was on SWIFT will, and on, on other major Russian banks, for instance, blocking their assets or blocking their access to markets, for instance, etc., will continue. So it remains to be seen uh, in the next... Uh, 24 to 48 hours might be a very important moment in this whole, uh, say, conflict as well. This is, of course, one line of thinking now. There are many others who are pointing out that this is probably a long uh, mm. conflict that we're going to probably see. So uh, that might be a different school of thought. So ultimately, I would still say that considering, uh, you know, many of us got the uh, point about Putin's attack in the first place wrong, very difficult to crystal gaze and, mm. you know, uh, predict what's happening in the future. But these look like the broad trends on the ground right now. Well, thank you, Prashant. We will, of course, keep staying with this story as it will develop in the coming days. Now, let's move on to our next story. Our next story is from the battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. Since late 2020, South Africa, India and a number of other countries have been seeking a waiver on intellectual property rights on COVID-19 related products. Known as the TRIPS waiver, this would have enabled greater production of these products in the Global South countries as well. However, largely due to opposition from rich countries and Big Pharma, this proposal has not been approved by the World Trade Organization. Now, recently, four key players, the US, European Union, India and South Africa, have been discussing a limited waiver. Simultaneously this week, the General Council meeting of the WTO took place. Preeti Patnaik, founding editor of Geneva Files, talks about the discussions between the small group as well as what happened in this week's General Council meeting of the WTO. Let's take a look. You know, the, the origins of this small group um, actually go back to December 2021 when uh, the WTO ministerial conference, the 12th ministerial conference that was scheduled to happen in early December got uh, suddenly postponed because of, uh, uh, you know, fears of Omicron and, and it impeded um, uh, the conference. Um, following that, India had suggested um, that WTO members should meet virtually for a meeting that will um, solely address uh, TRIPS waiver. Uh, and that did not happen. Uh, but instead, um, uh, the Director General of the WTO, um, Ngozi uh, Okonjo Idiela, uh, has led uh, these discussions um, from that period, um, getting together these four key members um, to see whether progress can be made. And these have basically been um, high level discussions at the minister um, and, and the ambassador level. Um, and they have had a couple of these discussions through uh, December and January. 
Um, so these small group meetings have continued um, technically under uh, WTO processes. It is not uncommon for smaller groups of countries uh, to come together and discuss difficult political issues. Um, and then, you know, at some point they, they take, take back the discussions to the wider membership. So this is the context of the uh, small group uh, discussions. Uh, the assumption is um, that if you are able to achieve some kind of a breakthrough uh, among these four key members, uh, then you will be able to actually uh, arrive at a consensus within a wider group of members. And, and um, as you are aware that India and South Africa were the original proponents of the TRIPS waiver proposal, and they have about more than 60 other co-sponsors, um, while the US uh, supports uh, the waiver um, on, on vaccines, uh, in in um, principle, uh, the EU um, has had more reservations um, on on uh, the original waiver proposal. So essentially, these are the key members uh, on either sides, if you can say that. Uh, and that's why it's important to get these. Uh, it has been important to get these four members together. Um, one of the most um, important developments for this week is actually the fact that the members got together and agreed on a date for the ministerial, which will now be in June uh, 2022, um, and that you know, officials say, provide some kind of an anchor uh, so that these uh, discussions, including the TRIPS waiver discussions and other WTO deliverables around the ministerial will get an impetus because now they have a deadline. Um, and we, we'll, we'll see how, how that actually, uh, whether that actually works. Um, and the DG has also reportedly said that um, particularly the TRIPS waiver discussions should not, you know, they should not wait uh, to resolve it up until June, and this is something that they should, uh, you know, try and crack it uh, well, well before. Um, um, but, but um, as as we reported, it's not clear whether there is um, any pronounced urgency on either sides, um, as it were, to resolve this quickly. They might have their own reasons. Um, so I think um, there technically there has not been, um, as far as the TRIPS waiver discussions are concerned, no major breakthroughs this, this week. We did have a TRIPS Council um, meeting, of course, um, uh, but um, that that essentially, you know, uh, also sub they submitted a um, draft oral report at the General Council meeting saying that, you know, discussions are continuing and um, uh, the processes is very much within uh, the ages of the TRIPS Council discussions. Um, so, so nothing much to report on as far as this particular week is concerned, other than the fact that they agreed on a date, and that might in some way contribute to uh, hastening of the process. Um, I, I do believe that the discussions are actually now entering a fairly uh, crucial phase. Um, and, and as you know, that there, are, there have been some proposals uh, to limit uh, the scope of the implementation of the TRIPS waiver, uh, potentially to include some big generic markets uh, such as India and China, or proposals such as to um, restrict the implementation of the waiver to African countries, for example. So all of these discussions are, are you know, uh, uh, continue to be considered among the four uh, members. Um, so between now and, and June, um, we do expect uh, that you know there will be some kind of a breakthrough or a consensus. We do not know um, finally what kind of an outcome the four members will you know agree on. Um, be that as it may, uh, at some point it will be um, you know taken back into the wider membership, um, and I'm sure um, we are told that other members will will have uh, you know the inputs. After all, um, it's an extremely important important and highly political decision to you know, temporarily suspend uh, and waive obligations of a WTO agreement. So members will have um, their views and they would want to carefully construct this, um, we've been told. Um, and also, I think uh, what's important to note that um, the, the waiver discussions cannot be looked at in isolation. Uh, there is a parallel um, a track, which is uh, the Trade and Health Initiative. Um, you know, led originally by, by the EU, um, and that is uh, turning out to be a political declaration uh, that will essentially uh, pronounce, um, you know, um, a, a sort of a, a code on, on uh, um, how members should respond, um, you know, how their trade policy should respond in the, in the time of a future health emergency. Uh, so, so that is something which is very important to EU and partners. Um, and um, uh, there will be, uh, we understand, an element of IT uh, in the WTO response to the pandemic, which is the Trade and Health Initiative. 
um, uh, but to what extent um, you know the TRIPS waiver uh, will be referenced um, in the WTO response to the pandemic remains to be seen. Because uh, remember that the TRIPS waiver, if it comes through, uh, will be legally binding. But the WTO response to the pa pandemic is a uh, will be a political declaration, and it will be technically not uh, binding, but nevertheless important. That's what members say. Uh, so I think between now, now and June, um, uh, things really uh, will hopefully move uh, fast um, in terms of um, uh, arriving arriving at uh, at an outcome for the waiver. As much as it is important um, for for countries uh, on both sides of this discussion, it is also important for international institutions such as the WTO and the WHO as well. Um, so I think um, it it remains to be um, you know a, a, a very exciting uh, um, period coming up. That's all that we have today on Daily Debrief. Do join us on Monday and keep following People's Dispatch. Thank you. Thank you.